South Vietnamese forces attacked communist positions at Swan Lok, only 37 miles from Saigon. After its catastrophic defeats recently, and the panic fights in northern and central Vietnam, the South's army seems to have steeled itself for what many believe will be the final battle of this 20-year war, the one for Saigon itself. For the moment, it's fiercely resisting the communist tide, but past experience inspires little confidence in its ability to hold out against a really determined communist assault on the capital. The startling communist success has revived debate about the so-called domino theory, the thesis that in unstable conditions, the first state to fall to the communists will inevitably push other nearby states in that direction too. This map shows how the theory might apply in Southeast Asia. Communist forces have already overrun Cambodia and look poised to take South Vietnam before long. If that happened, the pressure would then be on Laos, the striped area on the map, where a coalition government, including the communists, was set up over a year ago. According to the theory, if Laos went wholly communist, this would seriously call into question the future of neighbouring Thailand and also of Malaysia further south. In fact, Thailand has already asked all American forces to leave within a year and communist insurgents have been active recently in northern Malaysia. Elsewhere in Asia, especially in the Philippines, insurgent movements can only have been encouraged by events in Indochina. There are two rebel movements in the Philippines, a communist one in the north, and a Muslim war of secession in the south, based on the island of Mindanao. It's the southern conflict we're going to look at now. Five hundred miles south of Manila, a land of heavy jungle and numerous creeks, Mindanao has been the main battleground of the five-year-old war. For the young Muslim rebels, it's ideal guerrilla country. These men belong to the Bangsa Moro army, a fighting force now 20,000 strong, that's proved itself the equal to the Filipino army. They call themselves Moros after a name given them by Spanish colonizers, who were reminded of the Moors they met in North Africa. There are three and a half million Muslims in the Philippines, about a tenth of the total population. The great majority of them live in the south, where they've struggled to preserve their own culture and way of life against a variety of foreign rulers, Spaniards, Japanese, and most recently, Christian Filipinos. <laughs> For the most part, the Muslims are poor peasants and fishermen. For over 300 years, they've preferred to deal with their co-religionists in Borneo and Indonesia. Their problems began in earnest after the Second World War, when Christian settlers in the northern Philippines began to move south in search of land and brought with them a culture that had no place for Islamic traditions. Some unscrupulous settlers exploited the weaknesses of the semi-feudal system among the Muslims and swindled many illiterate peasants out of their land. And the so-called Yagas, the gangs of Christian gunmen who intimidate the peasants, are still a feature of the war in the South today. In the last three years, the government's built up its forces in the south until nearly 40,000 regular troops are now committed to the region. But they've achieved nothing. In fact, the guerrillas control more territory now than at any time since the war began. On paper, the government's troops are better equipped, but they're consistently outmaneuvered by the lightly armed rebels. Though the Filipino army hasn't made much impact on its enemy, its operations have caused large-scale destruction in many towns and villages. The 
Filipino Air Force can, and often does, use Sabre jets against suspected rebel positions. And infantry units following up the strikes sometimes burn down whole villages. The result is 200,000 refugees in the south and disruption to the lives of a million other people. President Marcos has always played down the war, often suppressing the worst setbacks. But at the beginning of this year, even he spoke of the growing perils in Mindanao. At the same time, the government decided to explore the possibilities of a negotiated settlement. President Marcos had been under pressure to talk ever since the Islamic Nations Foreign Ministers Conference in Malaysia last June. No doubt conscious of a possible oil boycott by Arab states if he refused, the president agreed to send a delegation to meet the rebels in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. For the Bangsa Moro army, it was an important breakthrough. The first time that Manila had agreed to meet their chosen representatives. In all previous peace moves, the government had always dealt with the traditional Muslim chiefs and politicians, who'd little influence within the rebel movement. The political leader of the rebels is Nur Misuari, a former professor at Manila University. He's chairman of the MNLF, the Moro National Liberation Front, in Jeddah, led the rebel delegation to Jeddah in January. Made a very big the talks failed, they even though Misuari gave up his claim for complete independence Filipino and said he'd accept a wide degree of, uh, of regional autonomy area, instead. We that asked him if that concession still, still holds for any new talks. talks. Yes, it does. And, and we, we do not want to debate from that, that because it is consistent with the recommendation of the Fifth Islamic uh, uh, Foreign Minister's Conference. We maintain that uh, the two parties to the conflict should not deviate from that unnecessarily. I understand that you've been under some pressure from your Islamic friends and backers to get some kind of negotiations going again before the next Islamic Foreign, Con uh, Foreign Minister's Conference in Cairo. Is that so? Well, there is actually no organized pressure on us. All what they want is that negotiation would be uh, resumed. But uh, they understand our situation and they are behind us. They said that uh, it is useless for any negotiation to be resumed unless there would be a preliminary understanding between the two parties. And uh, for that reason, the Moro National Liberation Front uh, will uh, insist on uh, the preliminary conditions that we have sent to uh, the Islamic Secretariat uh, to be conveyed to President Marcos. And Can you government. tell us what these new conditions are? First, we want the Philippine government to make uh, open and formal declaration to the effect that uh, uh, the Philippine government is accepting in principle our right to self-determination, in other words, the right uh, to uh, uh, regional autonomy. It is a limited form of self-determination. And the second one is that we want the Moro National Liberation Front to uh, have an assurance from the Philippine government that the panel that would be assigned to negotiate with us uh, would be uh, uh, authorized to uh, negotiate with us on that matter and uh, to make commitment binding to the Philippine government. Do you think President Marcus will agree to these conditions? Well, from the look of things, the President of the Philippines is not quite prepared to concede to that. President Marcos has said he's not prepared to give up any territory, but that doesn't mean he's not prepared to continue the dialogue with the rebels. Since the Jeddah talks, there's been a referendum in the Philippines in which nearly 90% of the electorate voted to continue the president's martial law regime. With that kind of support, President Marcos believes he can reopen talks with all rebel groups, but on his own terms. The Islamic uh, nations 
suggested a political solution by uh, actual negotiations with uh, all rebel groups and forces in the Mindanao area, uh, specifically referring to the Moro National Liberation Front. In short, the Islamic nations suggested negotiations not just with the Moro National Liberation Front, but with all rebel forces. I've therefore directed all the uh, officers and men in the armed forces as well as the cabinet <coughs> members to now implement uh, this suggestion. We will now negotiate not only with the Moro National Liberation Front, but openly with all rebel groups in Mindanao, Basilan, Tawi-Tawi, Sulu, and uh, Palawan. In incidentally, um, I speak of negotiations and of uh, meeting with these rebels as if we are recognizing the belligerency. No, we, we uh, would like you to know, we'd like to inform the whole world. Uh, we do not recognize the status of belligerency under international law of any group. The government's just started talks with one group of Muslims in the south of Zamboanga City. In fact, there are minor splinter group and the MNLF itself has decided not to attend. After the failure at Jeddah, there are some in the MNLF who think that a new incremental initiative and the outside world no, Mr. again. Take the war to Manila in order to win it. Well, you see, the Philippine government is facing two revolutions at the same time. There's a revolutionary uh, ferment going on in the north and in Visayas. We expect that uh, in due time this will uh, explode. But. Uh, the Moro National Liberation Front, of course, at the moment is res restraining itself. But as a revolutionary movement, well, the option is always left to us to expand our operation everywhere in order to uh, be able to convince the Philippine government about the uh, need for an immediate solution to avoid the prolongation of the agony of our people. As a matter of fact, uh, if worse comes to worse, we might even... Uh, expand this to the outside world. What do you I mean hope, by that? Uh, you see, there are times when, uh, when revolutionaries uh, are forced to take uh, extreme measures. And uh, experiences would show that uh, the outside world is not uh, necessarily uh, uh, close to that option. The Palestinians have done this and it was quite effective. Before, nobody would listen to them. But uh, after they uh, expanded their fronts and uh, operated outside the border, outside the confine of their territory, then and only then that the outside world, particularly their enemies, came to take them seriously. Uh, if you mean things like hijacking, is there not the danger that you would alienate the rest of the world rather than win its support? Yes, of course, we will alienate the rest of the world if uh, we would be indiscriminate about it. But uh, it's going to be one which would be resorted to only under extreme necessity without necessarily uh, uh, creating uh, any inconvenience to the outside world. We just want to uh, deal our enemy uh, accordingly. Do you think that moment of extreme necessity is uh, far away? It's still far away at the moment because we can still handle the situation inside. And uh, there is still uh, some uh, possibility that uh, uh, where we can bring pressure upon the Philippine government to uh, talk to us seriously through our activities inside. The most encouraging sign for the rebels has been the growing support for their cause from the Islamic nations of the world. It's the pressure they can exert on Manila that could prove crucial. For if the war drags on, 
it seems more and more likely that it can only be settled round the diplomat's table and not in the jungle battlefields of Mindanao.